Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Briefing. Today, we'll focus on ChatGPT and its implications for education. My name is Lainey Rutko, and I'm Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Initiatives at Johns Hopkins University. I'm also a professor at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and the School of Advanced International Studies. I'll be moderating today's briefing. Like many of you, I'm the parent of a school-aged child. For me, as for so many parents, I am heading into this new school year wondering about ChatGPT and related technologies. We want our children and our students to benefit from the latest advances, but it feels like there are so many unknowns. And that brings me to today's briefing. New technology like ChatGPT can lead us to dream big while simultaneously raising urgent alarms. Today, three of my colleagues from across Johns Hopkins will talk us through AI language models and what this coming year may bring. Jim Diamond is an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Daniel Kashabi is an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins Whiting School of Engineering. And Thomas Ridd is the director of the Alperovich Institute for Cybersecurity Studies and a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. I want to remind our audience, we will be providing answers to your questions in real time. So please submit questions for our experts in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. When you do so, if possible, please include your organizational affiliation. I'll now turn to each of our panelists for some very brief initial thoughts, and then we will quickly move to Q&A. Jim, many parents and educators fear that large language models like ChatGPT will lead to rampant cheating and curb the curiosity of students. What are your thoughts about the challenges and the potential of these AI systems? Thanks, Lainey. Um, so let me start by acknowledging that any anxiety is completely valid. Uh, nobody should let anybody tell them that any um, questions or concerns they have about the use of this technology are somehow outdated or misguided. Um, the sudden introduction of any new technology into an educational setting, especially one uh, that may be as powerful as something like artificial intelligence, rightly raises concerns. Um, there are any number of reasons for concern, as you just expressed. There are concerns about plagiarism and cheating. Uh, possibly a reduced effort, at least among some learners, to solve problems and build their own understandings about the world. Um, there are also real concerns about AI perpetuating existing biases um, and inaccuracies, uh, as well as privacy concerns uh, about the use of the technology. So what do I think parents and educators can do to address some of these concerns? One of the things that a parent or caretaker can do is sit next to their kid and explore the technology with them. Approaching something like ChatGPT, uh, like any other educational technology with curiosity, openness, a sense of wonder, can help their kids to see these tools, this tool as, uh, as something to explore, as something to create with or not. Kids can formulate their own conclusions about the technology. Asking I wonder questions as you're sitting next to your child. I wonder if we can do this. I wonder what happens when we do this. I wonder what ChatGPT will say when we put this in. Those questions while you're sitting alongside your child can open up this technology potentially for exploration while allowing your child to come to their own conclusions about whether they want to use it. Educators can have discussions with their students about what might compel a learner to cheat. Um, educators can think about the assignment and testing conditions. Is there something that can be changed to make cheating less necessary or compelling in a manner of speaking? 
Um, educators can also start to develop their students' AI literacy to help them understand what the technology is, what it can and cannot do, and what they can do it with it, what, what their students can do with it. I think there are some incredible potentials uh, with the technology. There are some really powerful implications for personalized learning, for easing certain work burdens. Um, there's the potential to foster deeper interest in topics among students. Um, there's the possibility of using not just Ch uh, ChatGPT, but other AI um, supported tools um, to create new materials or to have the AI generate draft materials and have learners build off of those and explore new ways to become creative. Um, so I'll say like just about every other piece of educational technology I've come across in my career, I'm cautiously optimistic about ChatGPT until proven otherwise. Um, we do not have to allow the technology to dictate the terms here or the people who create the technologies. Families, schools, communities, countries, we get to decide the role that the technology plays in education. But for that to happen, we have to have open communication and transparency. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing this? What are the ends of education? What are the purposes of the types of activities in which we have our students engaged? Asking ourselves those questions helps us become more effective users of the technology. Thanks, Lainey. Thanks, Jim. Daniel, you're working on several exciting projects that incorporate chatbots into the classroom. Could you tell us a bit about that and how this type of AI could be beneficial for educators and students? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a technologist by training, and most of my focus goes into addressing technology question around generative AI. Uh, like you mentioned, technologies such as ChatGPT that are built to mimic human-like communication. And as we know, these technologies, they have many limitations that are topic of our research. For example, uh, making the models more efficient, more safe, more robust, more transparent, mitigating their hallucination, and so on. So this is really lots of core AI problems that we work on. But beyond this core uh, AI research, we also see a lot of interest in uh, applying this uh, advanced technologies to applications. And the most relevant to the context of, to the topic of this panel is uh, K-12 education. And on that topic, I'm fortunate to collaborate with CTY. CTY is a center for talented youth. It's a nonprofit academic center at Johns Hopkins that offers a variety of high quality courses for K-12 students, and you know, since since their inception, they've been uh, they've been at the forefront of innovating uh, innovating K-12 education. And now, with all the recent advances in AI, um, uh, incorporating it in K-12 education <clears throat> is a <clears throat> is a natural next step for CTY. Uh, so, in this ongoing project, we are aiming to figure out what role this technology should play in the classroom environment. We, we want to incorporate AI in a way that maximizes creative thinking and reduces rote memorization and you know, a whole bunch of other educational goals. And doing this in a meaningful way is challenging, as you would expect. You, you're experimenting with effective teaching, effective pedagogy um, in, in real world uh, scenario. You, you wanna do, uh, classroom scale measurements as a function of you know, students' aptitude and some other desirable metrics upon finishing a course, which are you know, very delicate notions to measure. Uh, now we are in the middle of, uh, middle of our course design. We are you know, doing also all sorts of creative ways to incorporate AI. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, uh, and we are planning to roll out our first course in the spring semester. So hopefully in a few months, I'm gonna have a lot more updates to share hopefully many excited ones once we have our courses are, once they're up and running. Thanks, Daniel. Sounds like lots of excitement in the months ahead on this one. Thomas, you've said that the cheating narrative never really resonated with you. Can you tell us a little more about what you mean by that? And why do you feel confident that large language models won't eventually replace human expertise? Yeah. <clears throat> the we um, started playing at uh, size um, with chat GPT in the classroom very early. I was, I think I was an early, 
uh, beta tester for GPT-4 um, before it was released. And it became clear very quickly that specifically ChatGPT was a superpower that you can give your students in the classroom. And like uh, power in general, it can either be used for good or for bad. Um, but I'll give you a punchline. Basically, this tool, it seems pretty clear at this stage, is making the best students even better because they can do uh, navigate human knowledge more quickly. They can get learn to learn how to code more quickly. It just gives them the ability to move faster. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it will also make the uh, less the the you know worst students even worse or the lazy students even lazier because they will cheat. So in my view, one of the key things to get around in the to get across in the classroom is the. Uh, the power of this tool, but also its limitations. For example, it will start hallucinating um, fairly quickly. Um, the image that I give my students sometimes is that of a, if we look at human knowledge like an ocean, as an ocean, and artificial, artificial intelligence, large language models, allow us to navigate the deep water more quickly, faster. But as soon as we get close to the ground or close to the shore with the knowledge, the training material in the model is, sh is shallow, it will start to hallucinate. And that hallucination means it's making up things. So reliability is a huge problem. And we have to get across to our students that they cannot trust the output. We have to verify and fact check. Thanks, Thomas. I do see a lot of questions coming in, and so we're now going to turn to Q&A with our three experts. Jim, I'm going to send the first question to you, and there are actually several coming in um, that, that touch on this, which is you mentioned in your opening remarks that, that we set the rules, that the technology doesn't set the rules. So what are you seeing or what do you hope to see in terms of parents engaging with educators with, with school systems on this front? Thanks, Lenny. It's a great question. So um, I am, uh, I'm in the Graduate School of Education here at Hopkins. Most of my students are K-12 classroom teachers. Um, and it's clear that already some of my students are doing some amazing things with their own students. And I've at this point had a couple of educators come back to me and saying that they are engaging families in school-based conversations about how this tool should and should not get used at home and in school, right? So having the community work together to make decisions about what they think is and is not acceptable. And it's not surprising, they're not easy conversations, right? This I'm also hearing from my teachers because they, it does very quickly get to conversations about what is cheating? What does it mean if something like artificial intelligence can produce seemingly clear uh, and acceptable responses, right? What are we to do with that case because our, uh, in that case because our students have access to these technologies? I've not heard yet from any of my own students that they are in systems that are banning the technology altogether. That may yet come to be. But to go back to your question, it really is essential that all stakeholders, all the stakeholders that we can engage, parents, students, classroom teachers, school administrators, policymakers, come together and have these discussions about how this technology is going to get used. If we don't do that, and I'll just finish with this, if we don't do that, then we wind up in a situation where we have the technology dictating the terms, right? And not even, not to be deterministic about it. Somebody's produced this technology, right? And the technology itself is learning from human data. It's coming from somewhere. And if we as communities don't have these conversations, then we're stuck potentially with a technology that's, that's calling the shot. So we have to be transparent with one another about what our goals are. Thanks, Jim. Daniel, something that we're hearing from our audience, and it's a follow-up to what Jim was just talking about, is how do we think about detecting use of AI software? So you're, you're a technologist. Is that the right way to be thinking about this? Do we need more software to detect use of AI in the classroom? Um, 
As in like how to, so software itself figuring out effective use of AI in the classroom? Is it being, both, is it being used effectively or are students using it in ways that are unintended, either for cheating, whatever that's defined to be here. Um, but several, several questions about detection of AI use. Detection as in generation of these generative models. So that, that question of, uh, yeah, I think that naturally ties to the question of cheating, like whether someone has written an essay, has, has it been generated by a certain model? Uh, if you want to look at it as a technology, technology question, uh, there are things that we can do to ensure that you know, there, they, you know some of the generations of generative models they're detectable. Like you can identify to what extent, what portions of this particular generation has been provided by the model. But none of these are robust. None of them are hundred percent reliable. There are scenarios under under which you know we can say that you know like we with some high degree of confidence something has been generated. But for the for the for the you know for the next few years we really I think as a technologist I would say don't count on those. We should really, I think, if you want to incorporate AI in classroom environment, we really want to think about scenarios that um, that that it reduces the incentive to to cheat, to generate, uh, to generate, to generate with AI in ways that it, it, we define it as cheating. And instead, I think you wanna you wanna you know it create kind of virtuous cycle, virtuous um, homework assignments where you know, students are encouraged to use AI and maybe kind of use it to build upon it and build something even better. Uh, that, that's how I like to think about incorporating it in, in the classroom environment. Thanks, Daniel. So Thomas, you mentioned in your opening remarks that you've seen examples of AI helping students and others to become more creative, to heighten the educational experience. Can you give us a few examples of what you've seen? Um, sure. I mean, just yesterday we taught a class um, uh, in which we got a room full of people who don't have any uh, computer programming experience, any coding experience, to write code. Uh, actually code that they got to work pretty quickly, simple Python um, scripts. Um, for example, to do things like, well, combine these 10 PDF files in this folder in one, into one PDF file. You know, very, very simple. Um, tasks, but they could do that by simply asking ChatGPT to provide code to them. Then they could run it, then they could test whether it works, and you know, explain ChatGPT what does this code actually do. So it would walk through them, walk them step by step through the logic. That is just an extraordinary thing. It's like having your own personal research assistant who can actually help you write uh, code and also do other things. Uh, the key thing, again, and I, I just want to stress this with an anecdote, is to get across the limitations. Like you, Lainey, I'm, I'm not just an educator in the classroom. I'm also an educator at the dinner table with my kids. My older, oldest son is, is five. So the, a couple of days ago, we were asking the machine that can answer questions, meaning chat GPT, a few questions over dinner. And the question was, does the Leaning Tower of Pisa have a toilet? The restaurant or not. So the ChatGPT says, uh, nope, does not have a, have a restroom. The next restroom is, you know, close by. The next day I ran into my PhD student who studied it in Italy and said, hey, Martin, um, is there a restroom in the Leaning Tower of Pisa? And he said, oh, yes, I've been there. Of course there's one. So I went back to my son and said, uh, so here's, the, here's, the, here's Martin saying, yes, there's a restroom. And here's the machine saying, no, there's no restroom. Who do you believe? And his answer was immediately, of course, Martin, he, he knows him. So um, that's a really powerful lesson for a five-year-old. You cannot just trust the, the output of some machine, a human, uh, you know, PhD student. He's not writing on restrooms in the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but still is more credible. Also some sophisticated dinnertime conversation in the Red household. <laughs> Jim, question for, for you from our audience. How do you think about inequity and do you worry about it with this kind of technology? So things like um, those who have access to high speed internet and, and those who do, do not, does this have the potential to exacerbate the divide between the haves and the have nots? Uh, in brief, yes. Um, I, I worry about it a lot um, in, in several ways. So 
along the lines of what you just mentioned, concerns about, as we've always had with any educational technology, access to the, uh, to the technology, ability to use it in different locations. Educators and parents who are well prepared to help their kids use the technology. So I think just as we saw during the pandemic and students going home, where we learned that there were places like internet deserts where kids just couldn't access the internet for online education, we're going to have the same issues. We're going to keep repeating these issues until we realize that we need to invest significantly more to make sure that there is access. There is also a real concern about AI like ChatGPT continuing to perpetuate inaccuracies and inequities, right? And we see this regularly. We see things like racism, like sexism um, come up in response uh, to ChatGPT. I've had this in my own encounters, but now I've also had several of my own students um, experience this with ChatGPT because the technology and my colleagues are far better prepared than I am to talk about how the technology learns, but the technology is learning from human data, right? And if there are things like racism, if there are racist behaviors in the data sets, then ChatGPT will be learning from those racist behaviors. And there is the very real possibility of perpetuating them. So we have to think about things like policy. We have to think things uh, about things like very intentional design um, on the back end to ensure that these kinds of inequities don't keep getting reintroduced time and again. Thanks, Jim. Thomas, question for you about security. So with tools like ChatGPT, how much should parents be concerned about their children's data being compromised? Does this open another door to security challenges? Yeah, that's a tough question because it really depends on specific um, uh, products that are being used, specific models and specific AI uh, products. And, and of course, there will be more down the line. So I find I find I will find it difficult to answer in a very sort of general fashion there. Right now, there does not appear to be for chat GPT an immediate uh, concern about data loss from a user perspective. That's, of course, different from a training perspective where, you know, the question of but the training point, I think, uh, just uh, to follow uh, on to what my colleague said, the training material, a lot of people think, and this is sometimes perpetuated in the press coverage, think that chat GPT, you know, knows the whole of human knowledge, knows everything, that the training data is vast. But I think it's really important to appreciate the training data is very limited and is probably going to get more limited down the line, not more in inclusive. Why? Because you know, proprietary or copyrighted material is not included. Books, even scientific articles that are not open access are not included. In fact, we don't exactly know what is included and what is not. And as lawsuits are beginning to be filed um, and uh, as people understand well, there's actually a competitive aspect to training material. I suspect we will see more specialized large language models in the future that may not even be openly accessible. But it does not know everything. The training material is acutely limited. Thanks, Thomas. We're down to our last five minutes, so I'm going to give you each an opportunity. Daniel, I'm sending this to you first to give us your final 30 seconds on the potential for chat GPT to upend education. Daniel, first to you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll be very brief. Um, I, I think there there are a lot of opportunities here. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that the technology is going to continue to get better, but the but the the progress is going to be is not going to be an overnight uh, change. It's going to be a very gradual change. You know, we are we are already saturating the data, the training data on the web, and uh, like other colleagues mentioned, you know, the, you know, the progress is is going to be gradual. Uh, but that means that you know we can kind of slow down, uh, take our time to build, you know, to rethink the technology, the education. Uh, that space is very exciting. But but then there's a lot of buzzes buzz in this space. I think there's more need to really do like uh, 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 careful uh, 
studies in classroom environment to find the optimal combination of technology and, uh, and, and student uh, output. I think that's, that's where the new opportunities will be in the education space. Thanks, Daniel. Jim, to you, final thoughts. Uh, so at the risk of repeating myself, um, is ChatGPT going to upend education only if we let it? So let's not let it. Um, let's be as intentional as we can be as communities, as educators, about what we want from this technology, how we want our learners to use it, and toward what ends. I, I think this could be an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I'm also not a huge fan of the idea of disruption or upending in education. I think they can be quite unethical. I think we need to be very, very intentional about how we use these tools. I think we stand a better chance of not having education systems upended the more intentional we are right now. Thanks, Jim. And Thomas, you get the last word. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to be, to be uh, an educator in this very moment because we can use this superpower. We can use it in education through the, throughout the ages. And of course, there are some risks for abuse and um, misunderstanding, but that is always the case in education. Uh, so I'm I'm far more optimistic than I am pessimistic. Wonderful. I'd like to thank my colleagues Jim Diamond, Daniel Kashabi, and Thomas Ridd for joining me today. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to everyone who attended this briefing, and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. A recording of this event will be made available on this website. If you have additional questions or media queries for today's panelists please follow up with Sahand Yazdanyar. You see his email address on the screen right now. Today's panelists, together with faculty from throughout Johns Hopkins University, will continue to work on the issues that impact all of our futures. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you.